All right, this is Frank Salinas. Thank you for being here. This is one of hopefully many interviews that I'll be doing with friends of mine and experts in the, in the online world and offline world when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, today, I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Ron Douglas. Ron, thank you for being here. Hey, Frank. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. You're actually the first guest um, that, I'm, that I'm having on today. Uh, I really respect you a lot. I've been following you for years and had the guts to reach out to you and ask you, you know, if we could do this interview. So thank you for taking your time. I know your, your, your time is very, very valuable. So uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, no, no it's, it's cool, man. We know each other, so it yeah. doesn't take much guts to reach out to me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for those of you who might not know who Ron is, um, look, this guy's been on tons of different shows. He's a New York Times bestselling author, sold over 1.5 million books, and he's been on Good Morning America, Home Shop Shopping Network, Fox, NBC News, People Magazine, and I think even like you were on Wendy Williams one time, right? Yeah, yeah, Wendy Williams. Yeah, that was uh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's so, funny. Go, going on Wendy Williams. Yeah. Like the uh, the next day, went to the gym. Uh -huh. and all these bodybuilding tough guys. They had all seen me on Wendy Williams, and really? they all had the same reasoning. They were like, "Well, I was watching it with my girl, and I happened <laughs> to see you. Like, oh, you watch Wendy Williams too? Yeah, I know they like that gossip too, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but that's cool. And, and for people like, you know, that maybe not don't know who you are. Ron is an expert in his industry. He's an expert when it comes to entrepreneurship. He's made millions in the uh, marketing world and helped lots of people that love to cook. And he's learned a lot along the way. So we're here to tap into his mind and see what we can, what we can get from uh, him sharing his knowledge. So hopefully what you take away from this uh, interview will uh, help you in your business on your endeavors uh, just through life because I know some people might be just getting started others might be watching this might be trying to make their first five dollars online others are, are, are making a couple grand and they're wanting to take it to you know 30 40 grand a month so whatever knowledge you can share um, I'm coming at it from what can I get out of Ron Douglas that will help my kids and their kids and their kids kids um, when it comes to mindset and how to approach life and just things like that so Thank you again, and so let's just dive into this interview, and let me see what uh, first uh, question I got for you. We're going to so, do it for the kids. We're going to do, yes, do it for the kids. Right? So uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship and becoming your own boss, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out with that endeavor, with, with that idea of, of getting going and becoming uh, an entrepreneur and not just being an employee? Wow, that's a loaded question. That's a, I can go so many different ways with that one. Yeah. I would say just expect that it's not going to be easy and expect that there's going to be obstacles along the way and expect that, you know, you're going to have to stick with it in yeah. order for it to work, but it's going to be well worth it. And I think the best thing you can do is just be exposed to people who are doing what you want to do get around all the people who have accomplished what you want to accomplish and learn from them. Even if you have to pay them for coaching, even if you have to pay them to be part of their inner circle, their mastermind, or go to different events that where they're at, you know, buy them drinks, buy them stuff, you know, you know, make friends and get to know what they're doing. Cause they could shortcut your success. They can make it a lot easier for you. And they could, you know, tell you about the different obstacles that they had to overcome, overcome, you know, so that you don't make the same mistakes. So I would say that that's probably the uh, best thing. Okay. And then as far as when you first got started, because you left the corporate world, I think in 2011, something like that. And no, you, 2007, 2007. 2007. And you were on Wall Street. I mean, you, you had it made, right? I mean, you, you had, you hit the American dream. You're working on Wall Street. You know, you're doing these things. You're, you're in the banking industry, I believe. And so what made you say, you know what, this ain't for me. I'm going to go freaking just sell cookbooks and, and I'm going to blow it up. I mean, what made you just start trying to go for it? Because I know in the beginning, right. I'm assuming, I'm sure it was just easy, right? You, you had all the doors opening left and right, right? Heck no. Heck no. <laughs> well, I mean, I was working for J.P. Morgan Chase and I was working on my business. So I started my business in 2001. I know I look very young and youthful right. and all that, with the gray hairs, right? But I started my business in 2001 and I was doing it part-time while I was working for JP Morgan. 
and I did it uh, part time up until 2007 when I was laid off from uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. So I wish I could say that I was, uh, you know, brave enough to just walk into the boss's office one day and you know, take this job and shove it. Yeah, you know, I got laid off, and uh, it was a, it was a blessing. It was a blessing because I could now focus on my business. Yeah full time. But no, I didn't, I didn't have it made by any means. I was making, when I left, when I got laid off, I was making six figures, but I was living in New York City yeah. in, in, uh, on Long Island. So my taxes were crazy high. I had all these bills and all that stuff. So it was, um, it was not like ideally what I wanted to do. I've always been an entrepreneur at heart and I always felt like I was a fish out of water uh, working a corporate job. So I was always looking for another way so what really motivated me was my um, kids. You know, yeah. Coming from a single parent household, kind of like dysfunctional household, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of problems growing up in, in Hollis, Queens. I just wanted to have something better for my kids. Mm -hmm. But when my daughter was born, I started feeling like I was like an absentee dad because I was never there. I was always working. I would only see her like nights and weekends and stuff. You know, sometimes I, in New York City, uh, it's one of the worst commutes in the country. So sometimes yeah. I would uh, wake up, I would have to be at work at 8.30, I would leave the house about 6.30, so I'd leave my house, it'd be nighttime, and wow. then I'd get home about 8, 8.30, and it'd be nighttime again. So it's like some days I didn't even see the sunlight, so it wasn't, definitely wasn't what I wanted to be doing. So mm -hmm. my motivation was just to leave there, figure out a way to make money on my own. Yeah, I can see that. And, and you said you grew up in Queens? Yeah, 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 Jamaica, Queens, Hollis, Queens. So, so t let's go back real quick because um, I, I don't know that much of your story. I just know I've read, you know, your posts on Facebook. Share with, with, with the audience what uh, just some of the things that you experienced growing up so they know that you weren't just, uh, you know, somebody with a pedigree and, you know, with a, you know, a trust fund baby or nothing like that. Let them know, like, where Ron Douglas came from so they can see that, hey, if Ron Douglas can do it, I can do it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My story, I could write a book on it, man. I don't want to go too much into it, but basically my mother and father, um, they were both strung out on, on drugs in the 70s. And like heroin was like just a casual drug. So yeah. they, they met in a heroin rehab clinic. My father was also a hustler. He also sold drugs mm -hmm. up in uh, Harlem and Yonkers and uptown um, New York City. And, um, and he was in there because he had got caught in a drug bust. So, and he also was a user, so he pleaded to being a user and they gave him rehab. So they met there, fell in love, got married and uh, cleaned up their act, got married in April of 1974. And in August of 1974, he was, and they were, he, he was 20, she was 19 mm -hmm. at the time. August, 1974, uh, he was found dead on a rooftop. Oh. Yeah, so, so he had, um, they don't know whether he was killed or whether he overdosed, but they was found dead on the rooftop. I still don't know to this day. Yeah. And uh, my mother, they had just got married. She was pregnant with me. So October, 1974, I was born. So six months later, mm -hmm. I was born after that. So my mother went into the deep depression, went back on using drugs. And I grew up um, living with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was there, but she was kind of in and out. And my early years were kind of real, you know, a struggle because of that. Yeah. And um, it was a lot of, I saw, I've seen a lot of things, seen a lot of police activity, a lot of drama, a lot of crazy stuff. Yeah. So, you know, long story short, I just kind of wanted to, that was my main motivation to not have my kids grow up like that. Yeah. You know, so. Oh, yeah, for sure. And you would say, would you say your gra your grandmother, your grandparents, they, uh, they fought for you, right? They like, they went to bat for you, helping you to get the, you know, as best as they could as far as like, you know, go make sure you went to school, they make sure you weren't skipping school and things like that, going to high school and all that? Yeah, yeah, but as much as they could, they were old. My grandfather was also an alcoholic. Yeah. He, man, he was like my hero, but he was also an alcoholic, so he was yeah. there as much as he, he could be. My grandmother was, you know, just dealing with a lot of stuff. So, I mean, they, what, what really kept me on track was my, my grandfather, he had finished college, so he was like a role model to me, but really kept me on track was uh, basketball. I just wanted to oh. play basketball all the time. Like every yeah. day I played hoops and I had a college scholarship and I just stuck with that. And you know, I had a, pretty much all my friends sold drugs and stuff, mm -hmm. but I just kind of stayed out of all that and I just focused on 
playing basketball. I wanted to go to the league. I wanted to be in the NBA and I wanted to do all yeah. these things and wanted to, you know, buy my mother a mansion and all this stuff. Yeah. So that was what, what kept me. And then the coaches that I had, you know, at the time kept me focused on, on those goals. So, so the coaches, obviously, because you love the, the game. So when you do that, you can't help but be there, show up every day if you want to, you know, get better. So the discipline of uh, wanting to get better in basketball, would you say that that discipline, you didn't know it, where it was probably helping you, you know, so you'd probably turn it into something later because of learning to show up, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Learning to show up, learning to uh, perform under pressure, mm -hmm. uh, learning learning to see the direct results of your hard work, you know, learn, because, you know, New York City was one of the, the toughest, most competitive places yeah. you could play basketball as, as a youth, you know, so I would have to just work really hard on my game, not to be embarrassed right. <laughs> out there in the park, you know, yeah. so I got really good at it, but it, it taught me a lot of things, it taught me hard work, it taught me to push myself, it uh, taught me teamwork, how to work with other people to, to get things done. Yeah. Um, it just gave, gave me like a strong mindedness of, you know, like you'd be in practice and you're running sprints and they would call them suicides. You'd have to touch every line yeah. and, uh, you know, run up and down the court, you know, foul line, half court, other foul line, baseline, and then run all the way back. And you would do these drills. And if you didn't touch every line and you, you know, you were tired and you want to just like quit, but if you didn't touch every line, the whole team would have to do it over again. So yeah. it just push you to have that discipline. I have to run, I have to touch every line with my foot, you know, make sure I'm doing it properly or everybody's going to be upset and have yeah. to do it all over. So certain things like that, it kind of got instilled with me. Other stuff like, you know, being, being you know, a big crowd of people, thousands of people watching and your team is down one and you have the ball and you get fouled and you go to the free throw line, it's like two seconds left and you got to hit two shots yeah. to win the game. You know, and you have to step up and do it. And just having that, that mental strength of being in that position helped me a lot in business. Yeah. So would you say, that, was it sports that made you kind of put something in you were like, man, I want to do something big than just – because, you know, a lot of people, they just, you know, we're taught go to school, do good, get a good job, and, and, and basically get a house. And, hey, you're living the American dream. Be glad you're in America, you know – they don't really think beyond like, you know, bigger dreams. And what would you say in the beginning gave you some like fire that put a fire in your belly? Like, man, I want to aspire to, to do something great. Well, I think it's two things, right? Well, just seeing other people doing it, mm -hmm. like have, having people that, that made it out of, of the neighborhood and did big yeah. things and having people that were friends of mine that just had big dreams and big goals, you know, made me want to do that too. But also just, you know, if you look at a lot of uh, people who succeed, they don't necessarily fit into the corporate world, you know, and not necessarily that golden boy look that, that they, they love to hire and they love to get behind <laughs> and promote. I definitely was not that. I was rough around the edges. I mean, I thought I was smarter than, than you know, my bosses. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, it just wasn't a fit for me, man. I'm just not corporate. I just don't fall in line. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a... A uh, circle trying to what is it a, a square trying to fit into a circle peg yeah, yeah. <laughs> that type of thing yeah so, I think those two cool. things like led me in the direction I went yeah and you said you started uh, your you started working on your business in two thousand one is that what you said or yeah two thousand one yeah okay and while you're doing it part time um, kind of share with a little bit of people with people what you were doing part time because you said you were getting home really late and you weren't seeing uh, your kids, you know, because you're working so late and the commute was so long. Uh, how much time would you spend on your business, you know, on, in, while you're trying to do it part time? Mm -hmm. So people well, can see that, you know, hey, guess what? You, you got to co come home and you got to do, you got to make some sacrifices. Right. Well, I think just not having a lot of free time made me gravitate towards businesses that I could get a lot of money from without having to have a lot of free time. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I started to learn how to make money from assets instead of money from my time, mm. right? And I started to learn how to uh, delegate as well. So I'd be at the job and I'd be like delegating tasks to like virtual assistants from the job. 
Yeah. You know, at the time, I'd be like shooting emails to them. Hey, make sure you get this done. Or, or my lunch break, I'd call up and follow up, make sure they get stuff done. So, I mean, one of those businesses was just building email lists. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, if you think about just building email lists, once, once you've built it, now you can reach thousands and thousands of people just by pressing send, just by typing up a, a quick note, quick email, and pressing send, promoting something. And the other thing was creating uh, information products where people can buy it, online access it the product can be delivered via the, the website so it, it kind of frees up your time so when you combine the two you have an email list and now you have your own information product and you're promoting that product you know it doesn't take a whole lot of time once you have that that built up mm -hmm. so i think that's what that was like the thing i kind of fell in love with like i could make money i was double dipping for a long time yeah and it was funny because i wanted to leave the, the corporate world but i i I did have a good situation in, the, in terms of I was able to tolerate a lot of their BS because I knew I was double dipping. Yeah. I knew I had my, my business making money and I'm like, I was just stacking money at that point. So I'm like, all right, whatever, you know, I was able to tell. And, and what's crazy is like the more indifferent you are and the more like you don't seem desperate to have the job that you have and, the, and the more, like the, some, for some reason that was attractive to them. Cause I would, I was getting, I was getting like promotions and great reviews and the more I didn't give a crap, the, the more they seemed to like me. <laughs> There's that, that movie office space where the guys like, I forgot, or one of those where the guys like just trying to get fired and they're, they're like seeing, wow, this guy's really great. It's kind of reminds yeah. me of that. <laughs> but I knew I could only go so far yeah. you know, in mm -hmm. that world. Like I was never going to be, well, I don't, never say never, but I couldn't see myself being a VP or, CEO yeah. or somebody, an executive vice president. That's just not what I wanted to do. Right. And once you started seeing what you could do in the online world with your own efforts, you mm -hmm. probably said, wow, this is a lot better, right? Because I'm sure you've had um, some days where you sent an email and you made a couple grand from that one email. And right. so that happened for me too back in 2007. I mean, you know, I, I'd send an email and, you know, I wake up, you know, in the morning, I had six, seven, eight hundred bucks in my PayPal. And this was like amazing to me. Right. And so I, I, I realized what you're talking about where, you know, I, my wife told me back then, she says, if you can replace what I'm making at work, I'll come home. And so it was like a challenge to me. And, and we did it right. I can't say it's, it's been a, it's been sunshine and roses since then, but it's, it's been worth it, right? And uh, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So yeah. tell me, share with everyone what you said. You sent an email to one of your virtual assistants. Um, explain to them the power of leverage, leveraging someone else's time and expertise. Yeah, absolutely, right? We only, only have a certain amount of time in a day ourselves. So if you're trying to do everything, you're always going to be limited by the amount of time yeah. that you have. But if you could leverage other people's time and reward them for their time and still generate, like use their time to generate more money than you're paying them, then you can get as many of those people as you, as you can, right? And just, you know, you have more and more time dedicated towards your business in the form of other people working on it. So if you think about how much time do we really have, you know, you got, you might sleep seven, eight hours, you only got 24 hours to start with. So you're talking, you know, 16, 17 hours left after you sleep and you got to eat and you got to, you know, wash up and you got to, you know, in, interact with, with your family or your friends or, you know, yeah. it, you might have six hours, seven yeah. hours max in the day to actually, and then you get tired and, you know, it's all type of, if you look at how much you, how much time you actually have, it's like, makes you think like, I could double my time if I get somebody else who has six hours mm -hmm. or seven hours, I get triple the time dedicated to my business, like, you know, get two people. You know, so it's just a matter of figuring out what you can assign them that's going to generate revenue. And VAs, I mean, you can get a VA, you know, a good VA, probably like $10 an hour or less. Yeah. You know, different, different countries, the Philippines, uh, India, Romania, you know, different places like, like that. You can find someone that's pretty good for affordable rates. But to them, it's good money. Yeah. No, it's a good trade off. They're happy. You're happy. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's one thing I, I, I've taught my kids. They're little, they're nine, 10 and 11. But uh, one thing I've taught them, I learned from somebody is what's one of the most valuable assets you have? And, and they will, will respond, your time. I said, good. And then I tell them, what's one of the cheapest assets you can buy? 
and they say someone else's time. I say, good. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just trying to know. teach them that, you know, uh, because hey, if the person's happy for 10 bucks an hour and they're helping you generate maybe a hundred bucks an hour, then hey, it's it's one of the, it's that synergy. They're happy, you're happy, they're doing something they like and, and you get to leverage their time and next thing you know, they're they're happy for wherever they live. They're bringing in good income, so it's, it's, it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, you know what's strange about that too is like, I'm very frugal, which is, I guess you know I have money and, and savings and stuff. But it's a it's a pro. It's pros and cons to being frugal. Like the, yeah. the con, the pro is like you, you're able to amass money, but the con is like you don't want to spend with sometimes where you should be spending more. <laughs> you, you know, because you're frugal, you want to hold on to the money. So I, I started working with uh, this lady Alice Seba, and we partnered up and did a bunch of projects and. Um, She's not very frugal at all. She's a, she's a spender. So she had a, a customer service a virtual assistant that was getting $25 an hour. And she was like, well, we need a VA for this project. I can get her to do it, $25 an hour. I was like, $25 an hour for a customer service VA? No way. Like, Are you kidding me? She's like, listen, she's worth her weight in gold. Like, you don't have to worry about anything. And she's not going to work 40 hours a week for customer service. You might need a, need a you know, four hours a week. You know, you might spend a hundred bucks a week, but it saves you so much money. And she yeah. changed my perspective on that. I'm like, okay, yeah. $25. I only need a four hours a week. That's a hundred bucks. And she handles all that stuff. Yeah. She's I, need to handle. I don't have to worry about nothing. Uh, then it started seeming more like uh, a good value play when you think yeah. about it like that. So it's all about like perspectives and how you look at it. Yeah, you're right. Cause I've, I've done that many times where, I know whatever I'm looking at can help me. I know I can get some golden nuggets, maybe even just a product. And then that cheap Mexican thing kicks in and, and I don't want to spend the money. So, <laughs> so I know, I know what you're saying. Um, and, and I, I know exactly. And, and see, and that's what sometimes what I think keeps people from trying is they won't suspend their disbelief long enough to go for it because they're, they're brought up to, you know, they're looking, they go to the store, they're looking at two cans of beans. And, and they buy the cheap one instead of the one they really like because of those five cents or six cents. And sometimes, like you're saying, I mean, it can really, uh, until someone comes along and expands your, 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 your uh, mindset on that, you know, some people get stuck in that rut forever. And then they wonder why, you know, things haven't changed. So that's, that's pretty cool. What would you say for someone on a budget, you know, who's entering the world of entrepreneurship, whether it's online marketing, whether it's uh, they want to start a food truck or they're joining a, a, a freaking network marketing company, whatever it is, what would you say for someone on a budget? What, what do you recommend just in general for them who are looking to become an entrepreneur? Well, if you're on a budget, I would say two things. There are ways to leverage other people's existing customers and existing audiences you know, and create win-win offers where you can leverage that. So if you're a food truck, you know, maybe you give coupons to like the local gym or the local, wherever people are hanging out, the local uh, movie theater or something, you know, where they can give it out to their customers as a, as a value added. Or maybe, um, maybe you get together with a, a bunch of different um, local businesses and create like a, a co-op type of advertisement thing where they all chip in a little bit of money towards one big ad that they, you know, one, one, one coupon book or something that, that they, you can give out to everybody where everybody that's part of that gets a benefit and maybe you get free advertising out of it. All right. And then the uh, second thing I would say is um, reinvest your profits. Right. And the one thing you don't want to be cheap with is advertising. Yeah. Right? You can be cheap with everything else. Well, I would say maybe hiring like, someone good and advertising are two things you don't want to be cheap with because they produce money. So don't be cheap with the stuff that produces money or enhances customer experience to get you more loyal customers and okay. get you referrals. You can be cheap with everything else yeah. except those things. So, so you would recommend, um, let's say they make the first commission, their first 150 bucks or they make their first, uh, sell. Don't go run off and start spending it. You're saying reinvest, if not all of it, a good portion of it back in their business so they can keep those wheels turning, right? Right. As much as you can. I mean, the best, what else are you going to do with the money, right? The best, the best investment you can make is in back in your own business. 
Mm-hmm. If you think about what, what you're going to invest that money in, you could put it, you could buy stock. You could buy probably, you know, what, half of a share of Apple yeah. <laughs> or something, you know, and you might get, you know, 10% a year. Or you could put that money back in your business. You might get, you might double that money putting it back in your business. So you have control over that money versus, you know, just accepting whatever return that you can get from different investment vehicles. That's good. Thank you. That's good. What future trends do you see happening in just the online world as far as internet marketing, social media, digital marketing, whatever you want to call it? Um, you, have you, you know, seen some, some trends or you think something's going to happen? What do, you, what do you think in the future in, say, next five to ten years you can see uh, evolving or something changing as far as the online marketplace, whether it's selling your own stuff or using a platform or, you know, being, becoming some kind of expert, what, what, what trends do you see in the future? Right. Well, I think it's going to be more and more about having your own brand, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's your own personal brand, whether it's your, your company brand and being able to interact and staying at the top of the mind of uh, your potential customers, like being prolific with putting out content, putting out offers, communicating with them, you know, sharing the benefits of what you're doing, helping them, providing things that, that actually help them. And um, if you can do that, I think you could stay ahead of the, the competition and, and still make money. But I see it as being a landscape where more and more uh, vendors and advertisers and people are putting money into it's really where the trend is going. And um, you have to use it. You, and it, it's a lot more people are online too. Everybody's on their phone, you know, so the more you can stay in front of those people and build your brand so that they recognize you, the more money you're going to continuously make. And the people that don't do that, I think are going to be left out because people are going to buy from the people they know, like, and trust. Right. No, that makes total sense. Uh, I follow, I don't know if you follow him or he's, he's, are you still in New York or did you go to Atlanta? Did you move? Are you in the New York? New York? Yeah, I moved about 18 months ago. I live in Atlanta. Okay. That's right. That. Okay. Um, I, Gary V mentions this, you know, the, you know, he trades attention, right? So the more people you have their attention for longer, or at least more often, you're saying those, those type of people are going to win, whether it's their own business or they're building some kind of agency or they're building some kind of downline somewhere or they pr- create products. If we can get their attention, uh, more often and we're going to be winning more than the guys that are just placing ads in newspapers and things like that. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. People are going to buy from people they know, like, and trust, unless it's some ridiculously amazing offer. Right. You, know, that you can advertise. But if you think about it, if you take, you take one offer and you promote it to a people, to a group of people who have never heard of you, never seen you before that offer could be super hot to the people that know you, but it could completely flop to the people that don't know you yet. So yeah. what do you do? You have to let those people get to know you first. And then once they know you, they're part of your, your tribe, then they, they're going to buy because those offers convert a lot better once they've yeah. you know, seen content from you, once they've, you know, you've been recommended by somebody else, once they are aware of what you do, what you're capable of and your status. Unless you're, you know, the big brands are still going to be the big brands, right? Yeah. You know, they're still going to have the brand budget and, TV budget, but if you're just an entrepreneur without a huge, huge budget, you know, you got to do those things. You got to build your own tribe around your brand. And um, those are the people that are going to continuously buy from you. Yeah, that's true. And what would you say um, are some of the big mistakes people make when they first start in their own business, whatever business it is, what have you seen? Or maybe you personally and others, maybe people you've coached um, or mentored, what mistakes have you seen when they first getting started? Well, I think a major one is just people approaching a business with their own interests in mind. Like I want to make X amount of dollars or I want to sell this specific thing or, you know, I want to do these things instead of approaching it with what do people want? What do people want to buy? What are they already buying? You know, how can I put a spin on that, put my own product out there, you know, my own angle on this product, but tap into existing demand that's already out there rather than trying to just, you know, put something out there that you're unsure about, but you, you think it's the right thing because it's something you like instead of, you know, what people are actually buying. Right. No, you're right. I've done that before and not, I didn't sell nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
So you would say it's good to maybe get some intel, right? Uh, you know, survey people, ask people what they like uh, related to what you're trying to make money with, right? See what they're interested in, see what they like, see what's their hot buttons. You would say it's good to be uh, getting out there and getting the information instead of you just thinking, oh, they're going to really love this pink, right. you know, pink and purple unicorn sweater. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can survey them. You could also do research on what their problems are what questions are already out there asking and how your product can solve those problems. So yeah. that's a sure way to, to find the demand when, you, when people are already asking questions about certain problems that they have. And then you come out with a product that can, you know, solve those problems. You know, the demand is there. Yeah. So I'm going to think of, a, I told you I was wanting to ask some unique questions and I'm coming at a point. What can our kids, kids, kids benefit right from us? And so what would you say uh, when it comes to family and balance, work-life balance and all that, what would you say um, you could recommend and, 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 and uh, speak to about just working together with your spouse, with your love, you know, whether it's, you know, a woman watching this with her husband, how important is that having, um, you know, this uh, one goal in mind? Because I'm assuming as successful as you are, I know, you and your wife probably writing your goals down together and things like that. How important that is, is having the same vision as far as business or in life and family with your spouse. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily the, the same vision. That's, that's great. If you can have that and if she's on the team to make that happen, but just somebody that's supportive of right. what you're trying to do and understanding when you have the right, you know, up and downs, you know, and you don't you don't want to marry anybody that's not supportive of, of your dreams either. You know what I mean? Like you got you should know that before you jump in, yeah. before you jump that broom, right? So just having that, like my wife was, was very 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 supportive. I could tell you a story like when I first um I don't know how much time we have, but yeah, uh, we go ahead. We got time. Yeah, when, when I first uh, got laid off, and I got laid off in, in 2007. My son was born in 2007. So I got laid off a month before my son was about to be born. Mm. Like literally my wife was eight months pregnant and uh, she was on maternity leave and they knew that. And I was getting great reviews. Everything was great. I thought, you know, everybody seemed to like me. I was getting promotions. And then one day they called me in the office. They said, Hey, we're having a meeting. Come back into the office at one o'clock. This is on a Monday. Come back into the office at one o'clock right after lunch. We're having a team meeting. So I go to lunch you know, enjoy my lunch after lunch. I come back a little bit early, go into the, the meeting room, and the only people there was the HR uh, manager and the finance director. Yeah, and I was like, ah, oh. I knew I knew what was up because I've seen it happen before. And they told me, hey, it's not you, it's us. We're restructuring the department, mm -hmm. and um, we're gonna have to let you go. Sign right here, <laughs> sign this paper, and uh, you know, saying that you're not gonna sue us for laying you off for no freaking reason. And uh, you can get your severance. So I did that. And uh, I got back to my desk. And the only thing that was on my desk was a, a cardboard box. Of your stuff. Like, and my computer was gone. They had taken my computer away. I couldn't log in. Couldn't do anything. I had to put all my stuff in that box and walk out of there for the last time. I remember walking out of there. And um, last time I was ever at J.P. Morgan Chase. And... I remember calling my wife and I'm like, oh man, we're about to have a kid. I don't want to stress her out. She's pregnant, you know? So I remember calling her and I said to her, you know, I, you know, you want to sit down for this? I have some, some bad news. Uh, are you okay? Everything's good. I was like, um, yeah, yeah. But they, they laid me off. I got fired. I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't see this coming. You know, I didn't know what she was going to say. <laughs> and I remember her saying, well, that's good, right? This is a blessing. Isn't this what you wanted? You wanted to focus on your business full, full time. Like, what are you talking about? Well, how's this bad news? This is good news. She's like, listen, you know, I still have my job. I believe in you and I, I believe you're gonna make this work. You're already making it work. So just go ahead and focus on that. Don't even worry about it. I'll, you know, whatever I need to do, I'll do. So I remember thinking like, damn, you're a good wife. That's like the best yeah. wife ever right there. You know, so I mean, just having that support made all the difference. And I remember promising to her, I'm like, listen, by the time you're 45 years old, I'm going to make enough money from this business where you can retire, you can come home and work with me. And, and that happened. She turned 45 
she left the corporate world, came to work with me. And then that's why, you know, we moved to from New York to uh, Atlanta because we didn't need to be near Wall Street anymore. And yeah. we didn't need to be in the cold and the crazy commute. So that, that's pretty much the story, how that happened. And now she's, you know, she's helping me with my business. You definitely want to have someone that is supportive, someone who has your back and someone who's on the same page with, you know, here's what we're trying to do. Because you, if you don't, it makes it 10 times more difficult. Yeah, and I've seen that before with you know, just watching people and following people how we might have somebody that's in the online world doing things and their wife has nothing to do with it. And sometimes that ends up shooting, you know, that shoots them in the foot because they're going one direction. The wife's just like enjoying the money. Next thing you know, she feels like she has no value to put into, into the, the, the business. Next thing you know, you know, don't last. So um, that's good to hear. What would you say as far as, do you write your goals down? Have you had written goals before? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Write my goals down. I write like every night, I write like a to-do list for the next day. Right. You know, I break it all down. Like it's good to have a goal, but you want to have micro goals too that help you move towards achieving your goal. Right. So each day you want to have like three things you can do the following day mm -hmm. that move you closer to your goal. Yeah. And, you know, three things a day after 30 days, that's 90 things you've done. Yeah. That move you closer to your goal. I think I saw you share one time on Facebook, you, <laughs> you had just a picture of, of your, your, uh, your to-do list and it was just scratched out and you, you're like, this is just how simple it is. And it's just like, yeah, no, no crap. You know, it's like people overthink it sometimes, but if you just keep your goals and what you got to do in front of you, it's just reminding you, Hey, I got to get this shit done. And if I don't, I ain't nothing to get done. So that, that's good. Um, as far as your self image, how would you say, I'm assuming because how successful you are, you have a pretty good self-image. What have you done to maintain that good self-image? Because I know there's days you probably haven't, you know, something happens and you're like, oh. So what do you do to just, man, keep at it? Because without a, a good self-image, no one's really going to get anywhere. I just do lots of gym selfies, like, you know, yeah. 10, <laughs> sets, 10 sets of selfies. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, it's always up and down with that, you know. You always, like... You know, I'm not so full of myself where I don't have days where I'm like, you know, what am I doing? Why do people want to buy from me? You know, uh, what is this really what I want to do? But, you know, you have to remind yourself. But one, one good thing to do, I actually learned from, uh, you know, James Jones, right? Mm -hmm. Internet marketer. He yeah. actually um, did a speech one time at, uh, I think, this event called Practical Profits. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I got from his speech, I didn't remember anything else he said. But <laughs> the one thing I remember from his speech was, he said, you want to have this uh, index card that you look at every day that has three things that you're proud of mm -hmm. on that. Or maybe just even a list on one side of it, on one side of the index card, just a list of all the things you're proud of, all the things you've accomplished, and then a list of things that you still want to do. Mm -hmm. So those two things, and if you, you know, have that on your desk every once in a while, you can reference it, look at it. He says, look at it every morning. Yeah, you know, I can't say I look at it every morning, but right. sometimes no, I yeah. look over and it's there, and I just look at it, and it keeps me like, okay, wow, I've done all this stuff. Yeah. No, yeah, that's true. Um, I've had you know a lot of stuff happen, just like everyone else watching this over the years, and sometimes I got to do like what you're saying and say, man, I've done this before. I've helped this person. I've done that. I you know released a case study one time that made Facebook change the terms and conditions. I mean. You know, I got to remind myself that I've done some good stuff on those days where, you know, <laughs> shit hit the fan and, you know, you're getting something in the mail or whatever. And it's like, you know, there's days where you're like, what am I doing? Let me just go get a job, hundred grand a year, you know, I've, and I've had moments like that over the years. And then I look and then I remind myself that, no, man, I'm in for the long haul. And I remember things that I've done in the past. I look at sometimes testimonials. I one time asked somebody on Facebook, uh, friends on Facebook like two years ago because I don't keep testimonials. I'm bad about that. And next thing you know, I had some people making comments and it felt really good because I'm like, I didn't even know I did that for that person. You know what I mean? And so um, that, that's good. What would you say uh, one thing you never fail to do daily that has contributed to you um, getting to where you're at right now as far as a habit? A habit? I don't know. That's a good question. You know, I'm not 
comp- like as structured as I'd, I'd like to be. I mean, certain things I just get in the habit of, like I'll wake up, I'll, you know, make my bed, I'll, I'll drink water before I do anything else. Yeah, uh, you know, take a walk with my, my dog most of the time. But I'm not so structured that I would say it's one thing I do every day, other than the, the to-do to do list. Yeah. You know, having that in place and, and, you know, knowing what I want to do with my day before I start. So your, your to-do list is a habit and you, you attack it all the time. That's so. Yeah. Yeah. I always have it always like write down, you know, just kind of plan the day mm-hmm. of here's what I want to get done today. Cause if you just jump right in without any plan, what they say, <laughs> if you fail the, the plan, you plan to fail. Yeah. It, it works on a micro day by day level too. If you just jump right in, there's all type of distractions. You got email, you got phone yeah. ringing, you got, you know, social media, you got, stock market and Bitcoin and all these different things, constant updates and things. So if you're not like locked into three things that you really want to get done that day, you could blow the whole day and not get anything done and then feel frustrated. So um, right. you definitely want to have a, a plan for each day. And it only takes you a couple minutes, not even a, you know, a couple of minutes just to knock it out right quick, but it mm-hmm. makes you a lot more uh, effective. So yeah, and you've leveraged people's talent and their time in, in your businesses. Do you leverage other people's time in, in the family life? Do you, have, do you have someone that helps you do the lawn or do you have someone uh, do housekeeping? Do you have things like that? Because I'm going to share something with people watching. I have a thing with, uh, you know, like if I'm low on certain things, like say undershirts or whatever, I'll end up catching myself throwing laundry in there when it's Monday. 10 in the morning, I shouldn't be working on laundry. I've caught myself doing that. My wife's like, what the hell are you doing? Stay in your lane, go make money. And I've caught myself too many times. Do you have anyone, do y'all, you and your wife do anything to where, you know, most average folks, most people, friends of ours might say, what are you, man, you must be all, you think you're all that you got. I mean, do you have anything where you leverage other people's talent and resources to help you in your home life? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We have um, landscapers. We have a pool guy. We have you know, a housekeeper who comes in like once a month to do like a cleanup. Yeah. Um, and we have kids. Yeah. <laughs> you put them to work. Yeah. yeah they, they do the laundry and they do the certain That's good. Things. How old were you? Because listen, my kids are 9, 10, and 11, so I, I need them to hear this. How old were you when you put them to work to start doing the laundry for, for – do you have them do just their laundry or do you have them do everyone's laundry? Oh, they'll do everyone's laundry yeah. since uh, probably since like eight years old or so. Oh, okay, good. See, yeah, because I've had we started our kids helping, you know, wash the towels, fold the towels, sort the socks, and all that stuff. So I'm glad you said that because I'm gonna start putting them to work to do to do everything. Yeah, uh, it's good for them. Make them make them earn that uh, allowance. Yeah, no, that's good, man. Um, drinking water. This is some people might think this is stupid, but I do the same thing. I've learned over the last year, more than a year now, I wake, wake up and drink like 24 ounces as soon as I start my day. What does that do for you? I know this is related to business, but I mean, as far as just getting a jump start in your day, have you, can you confirm that that, that simple little thing helps you in a positive way? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can't get much done if you don't feel good, right? If you have aches and pains, a lot of times you have aches and pains and there's not really anything other than you're a little dehydrated. You know, you need to drink some water. You yeah. know, and it helps with mental clarity as well. So it's just a good habit. It helps your organs. It's just, you know, yeah. health as well, right? So if you're, if you're feeling good, if you're healthy, if you're vibrant, you can accomplish more things. That's cool, man. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, you remember me from before, but I was a lot bigger than I am now. I'm still a big guy. I was like 315. And one of the things that's helped me lose over, you know, 50-something, 60 pounds so far is just that daily habit that I started from, uh, from drinking the water. Cause I still, you know, I still like my Coca-Cola, you know, but thankfully not as much as I used to, but that one habit is, is I can see has helped me a lot. And I'm really big about habits. I'm trying to be more self-aware because I know the little bad habits are the things that throw people off. I'll give you an example. Like I stay up with my kids, we have a movie night or whatever, and they want to have popcorn and all this end up eating a bunch of junk and it's two in the morning and, and, and we go to bed and guess what? It throws me off for, for the next day. And why? I should have known better, right? I ate that crap. But, and I use the excuse, oh, it's, you know, movie night with the kids. And I should have just stopped at freaking 7 o'clock instead of eating junk at 12. 
what would you say those kind of little habits like that, how do they affect you as far as in business when it's Monday and you got to get stuff done? And if you threw, if you didn't stick to your normal uh, standards, how can that throw you off for, for the week? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, everything, everything puts you along a certain path, like right? along a certain like rhythm, like, everything is just rhythm and vibration. So if you're, in a certain groove in terms of, of working, in terms of getting stuff done, you will kind of stay in that groove and the, the deviate from that habit, from that pattern, temporarily throws you off mm -hmm. that path and you have to kind of work your way back. So over time, you, you figure that out. You know, the other thing is, there's, there's a time, you know, I'm not telling you not to watch movies with your kids yeah, and yeah. not to enjoy yeah, yeah. junk food and stuff. There's just a time for everything and yeah. you just have to, be structured enough to say, okay, well, it also goes into like being efficient at what you do. Like if you just, they say that that time, if you have, if you have three, if you give yourself five hours to do something, you're going to take the whole five hours, right? Like I forget how the quote goes, but, but time tends to get filled. Yeah. Based on how much you think you have. Yeah. Right? But if you, you could take that same, those same tasks and say, listen, I want to knock this out and three hours, you know, instead of five. Yeah. You can knock it out in three. And if you have a reason, like, listen, I want to go to the park with my kids at this time. You yeah. tend to get that done at, in the time you need to get it done. And then you can go enjoy stuff and still know, know that you, you're still in that groove. You're still getting stuff done. Yeah. No, you're right. It's how often you hear people, you know, get almost all the stuff done for their goals or whatever on closeout the last day of the month or whatever when they had those – other 29 days and, and next thing you know they they do amazing stuff in the last day because like you're saying they knew it was crunch time and so you know that's that's funny how you know human nature so if we plan ahead more and be more intentional about our day you're saying the people that, that are out there you know want to become entrepreneurs or already are entrepreneurs if you're more intentional with your time you're going to succeed a lot faster absolutely absolutely and a lot less stress as well yeah. when you get the most out of your time. Because you could, you could take eight hours to do something or sometimes you could take two, three hours to do it. But then after that eight hours, you feel like you're sitting there, you're like, what am I doing with my life? Like, what, do I really want to be doing this? I've been here all day. Or is it really that important? Especially when, like, one of the toughest things is, and I know this sounds like a good problem to have, is like, knowing that your, your bills are paid, are paid for that month, but still keeping your foot on the gas to reach other goals out, outside of what you actually need to make you know, is yeah. a tough thing to do. And then when you're sitting there like eight, 10 hours, you know, working, you start to feel like, why am I doing this? I don't need to be doing this. You yeah. know, my bills are already paid. But if you said, okay, I'm just gonna knock this out in three hours and then go enjoy myself, then you can get the same amount of work done, but it, it's a lot better on your, your psyche on on your like yeah. your mindset like okay you know i have i have enjoying my life i have some free time yeah because a lot of people might be at the office but 60 percent of the time they're freaking checking news feed and they're watching this next thing you know they're looking at a sales letter or they're watching a video man they come home tired or they walk downstairs or walk upstairs and how much do they really focus on getting getting the job done so no that's good <laughs> right. Um, what the other, you other thing I'll say too, I'll add also is uh, just creating what's called um, SOPs, standard operating procedures. Yeah. That you want to kind of make certain tasks that you do redundant, make yourself redundant so that you can pass that on to people and they can do it effectively as much as possible. So, like some things I'm always going to do because I, I'm just skilled at it and I just yeah. want to do it. But other things that, I don't need to be doing like setting up a, a webinar and making sure that the emails go out for that webinar. You know, I could create standard operating procedures step by step. Here's what you do first, here's what you do set up. second. You can back that up by like video demonstrations. But once you have that put together, you can pass that off to a, a virtual assistant or an employee and just make it one of the tasks that they get done every day. And so, because, so get good at uh, replacing yourself in as many areas as possible and just do what you're good at and what you love and then let somebody else handle the rest, right? right. So exactly. become good at the replacement game. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, okay, we're going to wrap it up here. What would you say someone needs to do right now after they've seen this, they've heard it, maybe they maybe they downloaded it or they're listening to it on YouTube, wherever. Someone put this on YouTube and also on Facebook if I can. What would you say someone should do right now if they got a burning desire, they want to change the situation, maybe they're at a job somewhere and they're capped at 60, 70 grand a year, 80 grand a year. Some people may be at 35 grand a year. What would you say? And they want to build something. They want to do something. They want to build a team or they want to do their own thing related to content marketing or, or list building or, or create a product. What should they do uh, right, right now as soon as they're done with this and let's say they're not at work or as soon as they get off of work, what should be one of the things they do uh, to move that one step closer to, you know, getting to those goals and those dreams that they, they have? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that everybody in that position has some type of experience or something that they know more than the average person knows. So kind of do some self-reflection, self-evaluation. How can you best help people? Right? What is it that people always ask you to help them with? What is it that you know more about? What is it that people always ask you questions and advice about? Maybe that's your thing that you could be putting out there. So I would think one of the things you can do right now is identify, jot down some ideas, kind of like outline different ways, different advice that you can give people. And then just kind of organize your thoughts and, and consider creating some content around those things, putting it out there, putting out little teasers. And when you do that, you'll see that people are into it. You'll start to build an audience for yourself and you want to, you know, you can create a product around yeah. that as well. So just get started, right? And, and focus on, on doing something, right? right. And, and focusing on what they're good at. Right. And not Lose the, so one of the main things also, if you do, if you do what I do, like I'm in, you know, content marketing, uh, in the expert space, selling uh, information and products and different things like that, you want to, lose the mindset of you know who am i to do this right. who am i to who you know who am i to put myself out there so that you know people buy my products or listen to me you know and you want to lose that because everybody started from somewhere everybody's in the same situation so it's like you just have to do it you just have to say listen i'm going to go for mine i'm going to do it and don't over idolize people that you follow online because they're just as flawed as anybody else yeah no you're right because I, I gotta you know i remember that too i catch myself like oh man look at ron man he's freaking killing it and look at this guy this guy and then i gotta remember you know what listen they're humans they got issues they got something going on it might not be as bad as me in some areas but other people you know everyone's got something right so you're saying don't overthink it and just start doing it no matter what because those people a lot of people have the same kind of internal things going on but the difference is they didn't listen to them and they just kept going. Yeah, just do it. Just put yeah. it out there. Just get it, get it out there. Get your product out there. Get your stuff out there. And think about the people you can help rather than the people that might judge you. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Ron, I want to thank you for your time. This has been an awesome interview. Um, I'm excited to put this up on my channel and share, with, share it with people on Facebook. And um, I'm, I'm, I know people got a lot of value out of it. And I want to say thank you for, for imparting into everyone watching and listening. And uh, I wish you a, a lot of success in the future and to you and your wife, uh, all the best. And uh, listen, I'll probably be bugging you later. Maybe we'll do another follow-up later for, you know, for something. But uh, thank you again. And uh, thank you guys for watching and listening. And we'll see you on the next one. This is Frank Salinas. Uh, make it a great day.